Hello, hello, and welcome, everyone, to Foreign Policy Thursday. Very excited for the show today. I did the reading, so I'm ready. So I think, or so I think. I hope you guys enjoyed the show opening. I enjoyed creating it because I'm learning how to use green screen. So deal with that. So let's introduce our... Our homie, he's our homie. He's not just my homie, he's everyone's homie. He is the new celebrity of the left. You may know him from plant panels all over the internet where he is just yelling at the black bourgeoisie. Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page, share, hit the bell, hit the bell, become a patron. Jason will put up the bait to patron link. I will put all sh- that good stuff up as and we super forget. chats are available if you wish to contribute as well. There you go. Look, there it is. I made that just for you. Can you see that on the screen? Bam. Yes. And coming all the way alive, he is everyone's favorite professor. If you're lucky, he may even be your doctorate advisor. You may know him from calling in the majority report and correcting Sam Cedar and Matthew Film Guy. We know him as our policy expert on all things Middle East and Ottoman history and Turkey and the made up country of Iraqistan. He is me, Jean Bajlan. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, I did need to call into the majority report to say that This Is Revolution is not my podcast because I was worried that I was going to get the Mau Mau from Pascal. So you know, He's been yelling at, he's been Mau Mauing uh, colored conservatives and the, uh, the the black political class for the last uh, week and a half now. So, uh, so I'd be, I, w- I would be nothing. You know, exactly. Collateral, collateral, collateral damage. damage. Gotta collateral go. damage. So I appreciate that. And also, if you could give Matthew Film Guy a shout out for me and tell him that uh, I look forward to the next Nerd Night. We're assembling it as we speak. So I'm very excited for that. And also, before we get into this uh, intro clip for our guest, I just want to say a very happy birthday to a person that actually is a big reason why this show is the way it is. Mr. Torre Reed. Torre. Mr. We didn't go to the PhD to be called Mr. Oh, yeah, he told me a long time ago about the doctor stuff. He's, he, 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 yeah, but I would call him Mr. And they call him Mr. Reed. So to Ray Reed, happy birthday. So today we are going to be talking about the Israel-Palestine conflict, but we're not going to be centering it in 1948. We're not even going to be centering it in 1917. We're going to go back, way back. Take a back look at this time. What the hell is Israel? It's just something Rick starts talking about when he's blackout drunk. What? In what, what, in what way? Like, what, what, what's my point? In a way that has no point? You just babble about defense budgets in the United Nations and then you pass out. So, to be clear, I sometimes reference the geopolitical complexities of the topic, which is not the same as going to an anti-Semitic place. I have no stake in this. I don't either. I'm, I'm just saying, if anything, the drunk version of me is probably so supportive of Israel. He wants what's best for it and- Hey man, I'm not touching this. You do you. What you are watching is a rare video of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, the last powerful Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and Theodore Herzl, founder of Zionism. Herzl, along with his wealthy compatriots, was trying to get Hamid to agree to let the Jews purchase Palestinian land. The Sultan replied, I would rather push a sword into my body than see the land of Palestine taken away from the Islamic nation. This will never happen. I will not start cutting our bodies while we are alive. I am not going to give one inch of Palestine to the Jews, as Palestine is not mine, but it belongs to the Ummah, and the Ummah have shed blood to defend this land. 
The Israeli-Palestinian conflict continues to shape the affairs of the modern Middle East. However, despite much of the recent coverage, there has been relatively little in-depth analysis of its origins. For much of the public, the root of the dispute is often framed in terms of ancient hatreds or pathologies of the Islamic region. Thus, the actual history and development of Jewish-Palestinian relations is obscured and obfuscated. With this deficit in mind, we will take a trip back to the late Ottoman period in order to examine the beginnings of the modern battle for the Holy Land. How were Jewish and non-Jewish relations organized during this period? What shaped the evolution of communal relations? And in what ways did the development of relations between the different peoples that inhabited Ottoman Palestine shape the history of the region? This is Revolution. All right, that is uh, what we're going to be talking about today. And I want to read an excerpt from his book, Jews in Palestine and the Late Ottoman Empire. While the conflict is often portrayed as an age-old religious one, in fact, it is a modern one which dates back to the late 1800s when the land was an integ integral part of the Ottoman Empire. During this time, it would have been impossible for the residents of Palestine to foresee that the first uh, stirrings of tensions between the two communities would turn into one of the 20th century's most persistent conflicts, with no end in sight at the current time. By the same token, it is impossible to understand the conflict in its totality without going back to the late Ottoman period when it was first taking shape as Palestinians and Jews began to transform into definitive political communities. This book seeks to tell the story of how, following the 1908 Young Turk Revolution, Palestinians and Jews each began to transform into political communities, forming distinct local identities and realizing the need to take concrete steps to claim their homeland. For Palestinians, this homeland was, I can you say it, Philistine? Am I saying it right? Philistine. Philistine, while the Jews, it was uh, Ertz. Ertz. Yeah, you are good at this. Why didn't you read this? Mr. I lived in Egypt for a year. You didn't ask. <laughs> So let's bring on our guest, Louis Fishman, who works on questions dealing with Palestinian and Israeli history during the uh, late Ottoman period, Palestinian and Israeli conflict, modern Turkey and late Ottoman history. He also has interest in construction of nationalism, state building and historical narratives. He is the Louis Fishman. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, thanks so much for having me, and uh, the applause is, is, is fantastic. It's, uh, I don't think I've ever been on a podcast with so many um, people applauding in the background, so thanks for having me. Thanks for that, that great uh, introduction. Um, I actually have never seen the clip of Abdul Hamid II and Herzl together. Um, I've written about it. I've seen the documents uh, in the Ottoman archives of Theodor Herzl. So I was moved by that that clip. There's so many videos out nowadays. It's hard to keep up, you know. Um, so I'll go back and later on I'll pick your your brain where you where you got that. So that was that was a it was a fascinating clip to start with. So congrats on a very nice uh, opening. I, I really have to thank say you. it was impressive. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Jean Bajlan helped out with uh, with some of the clips. Uh, it takes me forever because I go down. Uh, rabbit holes and uh gene had given me some some clips and some footage which actually actually got me in trouble on youtube um but i was surprised at how much israel palestine and i'm not even a fan of rick and morty i've never seen an episode of the show but i'm surprised at how much rick and morty israel palestine stuff there was there's actually a lot that was one of many clips. I almost ended with another one, but like, that's too much silly shit. It's a very serious show. We have a serious academic. He may not laugh. Maybe one of those guys that doesn't laugh. 
So I'm glad you're you're not afraid to laugh. So when we talk about Israel Palestine, we've had a few shows about Israel Palestine. Usually the conversation starts in 1948. Maybe you get someone to go back to 1917, the, the Balfour uh, the Declaration. What is the importance, in your opinion? Because, because uh, you know, not everybody's going to know about the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. Why did you want to center your book? Yeah, you know, to tell you the truth, when, when I was in grad school, I, I had started. First of all, I, I studied with um, I studied with Professor Rashid Khaled at Columbia. He was at University of Chicago then. And I and uh, I had finished my BA at, at Haifa University, and when I came to Chicago, I, I knew I wanted to study Palestine or Palestinians, or maybe Israeli history, Palestinian history, and then I went back to the Mandate era, and it, it's just by chance I had a uh, fantastic professor, Hassan Kayala, who um, I wrote a, a, a graduate paper for, an MA paper for, on Zionism and Ottomanism. So suddenly I went back to the, the Ottoman era and um, I noticed that there was a huge gap there. There was a huge gap both in uh, understanding the Jewish community and also understanding the Palestinian community and of course the Ottoman government. Now when you started your dissertation, your PhD dissertation, which I finished in 2007, in the meantime I put it aside and um, started with jur journalism a bit. I, uh, I write a, a lot about uh, modern Turkish politics and uh, Israeli politics also. I mean, by then, 2013, I came back. When I, when I, when I came back to, you know, get the book done, I think I really st started um, to dawn on me how, how really how much information I had um, in, in the dissertation and I needed to re rethink, rethink it also. So when you go back to the Ottoman period, you see that the conflicts then were very, very different. The understandings of uh, the peoples and um, their understanding of each other was radically different. And in, in, when, in some ways, uh, 1917 is a, is, a, is a nice start because that really, you know, it brings in, the, you know, the colonial, the British colonial power. And then 48, of course, is, you know, for, for Israelis, it's, it's the huge, you know, uh, independence victory. But for Palestinians, it's the, the tragic uh, Nakba, the, the catastrophe. So I, I, I get, you know, why people started these, these periods. What I can tell you is that when I teach um, the conflict or I teach Palestine-Israel, I actually go back and spend almost a third of the class in the uh, Ottoman era and then really trying to understand the roots of uh, the different groups, looking at them individually and together. So I think that really helps and prepares the way to understand why um, what happened in 1948 happened in 1948 because it's really in these years in the autumn years where you have a clear understanding of uh, political communities emerging oh, special thank you very much louis i wanted to ask you it looked like the deep state had gotten pascal and his question came since up. you're both specialists on the ottoman empire for many of our audience who are not familiar with the Ottoman Empire, can you define context, audience? What was the Ottoman Empire? Where did the power Can you ask from? that question again, Pascal? Pascal, your your computer broke up real bad. So can you ask the question again? Yeah. I said, can you put the Ottoman Empire in context for our audience? What was what, what was its role, its historical power, and where did it come from? Its size and history. Yeah, I think I think this is essential to understanding uh, my book as well. You know, the Ottoman Empire, for the uh, founded and or established in uh, 1299, the late you know the late uh, uh, almost you know around 1300, the 12th century, uh, for many years was was mostly a, a uh, empire based in in the southern Balkans um, and southern Europe in, in Balkans and and in Europe. And by the 16th century is when they really branch out and um, incorporate Palestine um, and Mecca Medina. You know, they incorporate the holy cities, three holy cities, Jerusalem, Mecca Medina, into the empire, which, which really transforms them into much more, I would say, of an Islamic empire. They were always an Islamic empire, empire, but I think that's one thing. The other note I would say is that for many years, it was a very de decentralized uh, empire. 
And within this empire, a typical Islamic city, very much unlike Europe where, where often Jews were uh, forced to live in ghettos or suffered expulsion, the idea of uh, Islamic city, whether in, you know, uh, in Ottomans or other Islamic empires, was that it, well, for the most part, often had Jews, Christians, and Muslims living together. Now that could be in different neighborhoods, that could be with limited relations, that could be other times living in together in the same neighborhood. Um, and I think that's something, what we're gonna see in Palestine was that it was not at all unusual that Jews, uh, Christians, and Muslims uh, are living together. And when I say Christians, I'm meaning uh, Greek Orthodox, uh, Armenians, uh, and of course, uh, Muslims would be uh, the dominant power. And the Jewish communities there were very, very uh, divided. I mean, uh, if we look at the city of Ederni, uh, which is now uh, on the Bulgarian border uh, with, with Turkey, um, it was a city that had a, a great fire in the early 1900s that 13 synagogues were, were burnt down. Now, what we know about the 13 different communities was that they weren't one community. You had the Italian community, you had the Sephardic community that originated from Spain, speaking Ladino, uh, you know, Judea Spanish. You had Ashkenazi community speaking Yiddish. Um, and you also had the Italian speaking Italian. You had numerous different communities. So when, let me, when we say that, your question is, is important because what happens is, and geopolitically speaking, is by the rise of uh, nationalism in the 1900, in the 1800s, uh, starting with the, with the Greek nationalist movement, and then with the spread of it in the Balkans, um, the Ottoman Empire shrinks a great deal. They lose a lot of territories uh, in the in the Balkans, and then what you have is much more of a Turkish uh, Arab Empire. Um, and towards the end of the 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 period where I'm talking about in 1908 to 1914, um, up to World War One. So in that sense, I mean, we remember what happens at the end. And what happens at the end, and even in, in World War I, was there was a lot of persecution of, of Arab movements um, by Jamal Pasha. Uh, there, of course, was uh, the, you know, uh, let's look at Palestine first, and the Jewish community. So a lot of people say, Arabs would say, oh, you know, this was a, a, you know, a terrible, horrible empire that we were persecuted under. That's sort of the nationalist narrative. But if we look back, we, we see that up until 1914, both Jews and Palestinians during this period um, uh, really can't foresee the, the fall of this empire. Let me add um, to your point, Pascal, a um, very important question put in context is that in the mid 19th century, there were also uh, reforms, the Tanzimat era, that centralizes, brings the power into Istanbul so that decentralization where each one's living in a semi-autonomous system starts to, to centralize, starts to modernize, and the understandings of equality start to take hold. So by 1876, you have the first constitution that is uh, suspended. It, it's established by Sultan Abdul Hamid II and then quickly suspended. And that's gonna lead to the Young Turks in 1908 who, um, you know, force a constitutional revolution on the empire with this idea of equality between all the peoples of the empire. So it really is a new playing field for understanding the Ottoman Empire and understanding the role of the empire. The last thing I will say, before we got on air, me and Pasco were chatting and you you, Pascal, you had mentioned that it was the sick man on the Bosphorus, right? The sort of the known as this. But what we're going to see is that through their centralization, through their becoming more and more compact, the empire actually became much stronger towards the end of its uh, existence. And in World War I, we know that they had uh, great uh, victories in uh, Gallipoli and, um, and other places. Uh, and it was not at all a given that the British, when they invade in 1917, Palestine, you know, it takes them almost a whole year from December 1917 to October 1918 to fully capture Palestine. So that shows you that the Ottoman army, which included also Jews in it and, and Christians, 
um, from Palestine, including Zionists, we can get to that in a second, um, was much stronger than many people had imagined. So I think that shows that this, the transformations of the 19th century, to some extent, actually um, were very effective. Excellent. Gene, I'd, I'd like you to jump in as well, please. We lost. We are, why don't you turn your volume on, Gene? You muted yourself. Yeah, I, th I completely agree with what Louis uh, just pointed out there. I would just add to this, you know, when we think of the Ottoman Empire, we have to think of it as a kind of, uh, as a protean uh, sort of historical entity, which goes through many stages in which, like, we use the term Ottoman Empire to talk about, uh, you know, states which were oh. quite different in different <laughs> historical Can you hear me? Can you, you, yeah. yeah, the dictate got you. Uh, you want to... Yeah. Back that up real quick. What did you say? Say it again. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say that you know we have to, when we think of the Ottoman Empire, it wasn't a static uh, inst uh, institution. It radically changed over you know the centuries and was actually highly adaptable. And when we get down to the 19th century, this process of centralization is critical to understand because it's not only administrative centralization and the creation you know the the the, the creation of a kind of standardized uh, approximation of a European nation state in institutional forms, we see the emergence of a kind of uh, 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 an ideology, Ottomanism, which is a new political ideology, which takes this term Osmanlı, which is an old term to talk about the people who are loyal to the Ottoman dynasty, and, uh, and imposes on it new meanings relating to nationalism, and, uh, and this concept begins to form uh, uh, as as the kind of basis of a state nationalism, a loyalty to the Ottoman state. And although from the state's perspective, there is certainly a, an overlap between uh, Ottomanism and let's say Turkish nationalism, uh, or at least sort of Turkish cultural uh, elements. So for example, in the mid 19th century, they would use the term uh, terms like civilization. Uh, what are they talking about civilization? They're talking about speaking Ottoman Turkish and so on and so forth. But at the same time, it's a suitably uh, protean concept that minority groups or non-Turkish groups uh, internalize the concept and take it and make it their own. So we see Ottomanism isn't simply like a forerunner to Turkish nationalism, but is the, a notion of some kind of uh, cosmopolitan nationality in which the various ethnic uh, communities are seen as poor, uh, as forming part of a whole. And you see this term, iftihadi anasir, which means the unity of elements, uh, being you know very much uh, this kind of notion of a of a kind of cultural melting pot, uh, which is very very important. So we have. We have this state nationalism, and then we have other types of identity pro projects, which often we view as kind of being in opposition to Ottomanism. So, for example, Zionism or Arabism or something like that. But often uh, the actors at the time would see these as complementary to the Ottoman political project in the sense they would say, like, well, we should support Arab culture so we can be better Ottomans, right? Or we should support Kurdish culture and language so that we can be better Ottoman citizens. So, you know, attachment to one sort of ethnicity did not necessarily mean a rejection of the notion of living within a kind of cosmopolitan multinational empire. And I would know there are many nationalities today that are made up of multiple ethnic groups, British nationalism, Indian nationalism. So the notion that you could form some kind of Ottoman nationality although at first glance might seem kind of uh, uh, sort of absurd, is actually, you know, was quite a realistic project. And as Louis pointed out, up until 1915, the majority of Ottomans, uh, Jewish, Arab, Kurdish, Turkish, they saw their political futures within the Ottoman Empire, uh, even Armenians, very few were attracted by separatism because it was not seen as a plausible political route. Uh, and if you want a comparison with the United States, you know, people were far more following the kind of Martin Luther King integrationist political route than the black separatist route, if that makes, if that analogy sort of makes sense to the uh, uh, audience. So that's what I would sort of add to that. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask one question and I'm going to defer to Gene. Can you explain the Islamic significance 
of the Ottoman Empire as the seat of authority and why they would even be able to dispatch of the affairs of a Palestine or an Egypt or every any other non-Turkish Muslim state. Either one of you. It's like Jeopardy. I, I think you said uh, the gene. I mean, I'll, oh, what, gene. What, yeah, yeah, what, I'll just I'll just say that the the concept of the caliphate transformed during different eras in the Ottoman era, um, and um, it really only after they after the capture of Egypt in the, in the early fifteen uh, hundreds, uh, um, when they take the the other Arab eras, do they even um, inherit this this caliph, um, this caliphateness, I could say. Um, and it's actually under Sultan Abdul Hamid II, where Sultan Abdul Hamid II in, in 1876, who was eventually overthrown in 1909, um, um, really uh, creates or reinvents the caliphate to his own um, to his own good. Um, and that really, so uh, what I say is, we remember the end. Uh, we remember the uh, the what happens at the last. Remember, like as I like as if it was always that way, right? So only I would say. By the early 1900s, there's no doubt that the Sultan uh, Abdul Hamid II is seen by many Muslims throughout the world as a legitimate caliph. Um, and I think that what, 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 what happens is, um, you know, the British are always very uh, worried about, you know, what's happening in Palestine and what's happening in the Ottoman Empire because they, they really believe that um, he had a great amount of sway over, over the local populations. In the end, it didn't doesn't seem that it really added up to that. Um, uh, Abdul Ham Hamid II today is remembered by people that revere him as uh, uh, Abdul Hamid II revere him as as a great leader. Today, in in modern Turkey, would be would be the supporters of of the President Erdogan, where uh, the people in the opposition would would see him in a very very negative uh, way. So it's it's interesting that the, how we interpret history um, throughout, uh, just not up to today, it's really divided on how people understand uh, Abdul Hamid II and the Caliphate. But I do suggest absolutely that he succeeded in reinventing it. And um, this is really important for countries that had large Muslim populations under their uh, control. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that sort of the, the notion of the Caliphate as and the caliph as separate from the sultanate as a kind of spiritual position is very much a product of ottoman weakness uh, in the late uh, uh, 18th and uh, sorry yeah in the late 18th and early 19th century whereby the notion that the, there was this spiritual position akin to a kind of muslim pope begins to sort of take form because previously the notion you know caliph and uh, uh, sultan although not synonymous uh, are seen primarily as political uh, 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 positions. But we see in the 19th century, the Ottomans begin, even before Abdul Hamid, but Louis is obviously correct, that this really takes off under Sultan Abdul Hamid. The reinvention of the caliphate as a tool to combat European imperialism uh, and to try, uh, uh, you know, basically in a, in a new political era, almost, uh, uh, you know, if you want to think of it as to create a kind of pan-Islamic, almost nationalism, not quite, but almost a kind of pan-Islamic nationalism in order to defend an empire that was increasingly on the military defensiveness. So uh, on the military defense. So the Caliph, I, and I completely agree with Lewis, we often project back the understanding of the Caliph from created in the late 19th century and successfully propagated around the Islamic world by Sultan Abdul Hamid back into historical eras where it did not have the same political or, or, or cultural resonance as it still has today. The, the, uh, I hope that sort of answers the question. Absolutely. But Absolutely. I would like to ask a few questions about, uh, I would ask, uh, like to ask Louis a few questions uh, about his book more so specifically. And I've kind of split the questions up into sort of questions focusing on the Jewish community and the Palestinian community, so we don't mi mix things up. But before we begin, I'd like to ask sort of uh, sort of two questions. In what way are sort of Israeli and Palestinian narratives of the late of Ottoman period different? And when we go back to that period, you know, what is the sectarian, cultural, ethnic makeup of Ottoman Palestine like? So we can kind of get a base read 
of, of what the period we're talking about is. Yeah, I, I think what, if we look at both the, the first, uh, the Israeli narrative has been the, the dominating narrative of how we understand the conflict. And I'm more and more thinking that this narrative was created and implemented, implemented by the labor movement uh, in Palestine in the 1930s, David Ben-Gurion, who takes hold as the as the hegemonic leader of the Jewish Yeshuv. For the ones that don't know, Jewish Yeshuv means the Jewish community in Palestine before it became a, a state. So it just refers to the Jewish community. So he becomes sort of the political leader in, um, by the 1930s and is the first uh, prime minister of the state. And the Labor Party really be, remains the dominant party in, in, until 1977. So there we have an overemphasis, I think, on the labor movement during the late Ottoman period. And my book will show my book shows that it, it was not at all a dominant movement. then. the, the, the settlements, the uh, immigrants, the ideas of pioneers, um, they were much of a smaller part of, of the narrative. Now, on the Palestinian side, I think we're hindered often by this idea of the post-World War I this notion of greater Syria um, and that Palestine makes up something called southern Syria. In all my readings, um, in Ottoman archives, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the books, uh, whether it's in the newspapers, whether it's in archival documents, I've never seen the word southern Syria before 1917. But it's something very, very embedded into sort of this Arab nationalism because we have to remember Palestinians are part of the Arab people and, consider, um, and the trends of Arab nationals nationalism, which affects all the region, also affects Palestinians going, you know, sometimes a more emphasis on the local patriotism, which I call local patriotism because none of them, you know, before 1914, none of them foresee the fall of the empire. So what is, I think the second part of your question, Gene, was that what is the, what actually is the reality in compared to the narratives? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, so the, the Jewish community during um, this uh, period, I call them, a, they're a hodgepodge of communities because um, we didn't have one community. Yes, you had um, immigrants, but you also had uh, local Arabic speaking Jews. You had a very large Ladino speaking uh, community, Jews that spoke uh, Judeo Spanish, um, emerging from um, Spain uh, in uh, the expulsion of Spain in 1492. And this idea that they retained the language just shows it as a pre-modern society, right? That they're able to maintain it as their, 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 mother, their mother tongue. Um, but then you also had Yiddish and you had um, uh, communities that spoke Persian from Bukhara, um, which is today present in uh, Uzbekistan and Tajik, uh, the Tajik Jews, um, which we call Bukhara from Bukhara. Um, and you had the Iranian Jews, Jews from Yemen and a, a very big, um, community also of uh, Jews from Morocco and northern and North Africa. So during this period, we see that um, exactly how you explained it earlier is through Ottomanism is that a, there's one thing that becomes that really unites all these communities together. And it's the adoption of Hebrew as the main uh, lingua franca of Palestinian of Jews of Palestine. Right. And I and I don't, you know, many books will call them Palestinian Jews. I say, and I almost said it right now, but Jews of Palestine, because um, they are developing into a Hebrew community. And it's through the Ottomanism that they can finally say, you know what? On one hand, we can be Zionist, not as a separatist movement, but as something of cultural pride. Because what are they doing? The Jewish community is actually looking at to Armenians and looking to Greeks and looking to Turks. As, as a way to develop their, their nationalisms. So the idea of, um, remember Herzl, you know, you have many different types of Zionism and, you know, one of them was political Zion, Zionism put forth by Theodor Herzl, who dies um, in 1904, a very colonial project. I mean, they offered, Britain offered the, the Jews a Jewish state in uh, Uganda and Theodor Herzl is very excited for this. Um, but the, the Zionist organization votes against it and says, we need to put all our focus on Palestine. Now, just four years later, uh, you know, just not even that almost, uh, there is now a, an Ottoman Empire saying we respect everyone 
to adopt their own local language um, as long as they implement Turkish together with that language. So uh, suddenly this Hebrew movement, this transformation of the community to Hebrew that started um, in the late 1900s um, really takes hold among the community. That by 1910, you have three newspapers, dailies um, in uh, Hebrew. Um, so it really, this transforms the community into some type, and this connects Zionist and non-Zionist alike. That's something very important, that there were quite a few staunch anti-Zionists within the Ottoman Empire, but they, they weren't against um, Jewish immigration to Palestine. Um, we've over, I think, obsessed with some of these, or we've over, we were over fixated on some of these anti-Zionists, but in the end, they were always for um, the spread of Hebrew, and also, um, and also, I, I would say, uh, strengthening the the Jewish community in Palestine, not for separatism. That's that's very important. So yes, you had, in some senses, you could call it a semi-colonial project because they are getting money and support from the Zionist organization, but it really is the local Jewish community who are who is the who is the the, the force behind this. And I think we need to rethink that history. We need to look at the local Sephardi community and show how they were an integral part. So it wasn't just Ashkenazi Jews becoming Zionist. It was something much more integral to all the communities there. And that meaning of Zionism was very different from one community to the other, but all uniting around Hebrew. That's something very key. Now with the Palestinian community, let me just quickly sum up here with the, the Palestinian community. The Palestinian community, I say, I claim, unfortunately, we've always read them through the lens of the conflict. And I think that's something we've really misinterpreted. I mean, it's, it's how do you read a, a majority population through the lens of a minority, that that minority, the Jewish minority, is not united either into one community to begin with, right? So. We're trying to understand Palestinians through the lens of Jews rather than looking at, I mean, if we do Ottoman studies, um, there's no problem to call uh, Egyptian peasants, Egyptian peasants. There's no problem to call Lebanese or Syrian, Lebanese or Syrian peasants. But when you get to Palestine, they were over fixated, I would say. They were over, I'm talking historians, especially denying the Palestinians existence all often saying, no, 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 you can't call them Palestinians. They didn't identify as Palestinians and they were Arabs. They were Arab peasants. No, but if we go back in time, we start seeing that by 1914, um, Palestinians start adopting um, ideas of a local patriotism, where they define, define themselves as the Shab al-Falestini, the Palestinian people, Rijal Palestine, the people of Palestine. And very rarely would you ever hear, I've never even seen it to you, the truth, where they, call, where they define themselves as Syrians also. There is a case when they go abroad there, I think there's a case where they define themselves as from Syria because perhaps someone didn't know where, what that meant from being Palestinian or what that's from Palestine. I mean, it's very much like how the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Turks, uh, Ottoman Arabs moved to South America and they're called Turcos, right? Um, so. You know, once you get out of that 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 you that uh, realm where you live and you and you migrate abroad, th th things change and definitions change and identity changes also, of course. But in Palestine itself, you know, I bring up uh, a sometimes I bring up a a very simple um, a thing is I mean so often so many people were just simply said that you know Palestine really wasn't such a a um, you know, identity, or they didn't they didn't identify as a place, and it really was southern Syria. So I'm just going to bring up a picture for you quickly here, because what I did was I just looked at um, very simple examples, I would say, of of uh, articles and stuff like that that um, that show us this. So in a second, I can bring up a picture for you. But yeah, so that's that's um, that's what I see. That I see that now. How let me let me sum up, and this might help us connect the two together. So what does this have to do with Ottomanism? Well, it has to do with the fact that the Palestinians saw the Jewish community separating, okay, through their Ottomanism, 
you know, if what I call it is, I say it's in order to separate, you have to integrate into the Ottoman, um, you know, the Ottoman political world, and they are becoming more and more autonomous. And that's why I say that if the, it's actually Ottomanism that places the two communities in competition. And that really is the defining moment that by 1914, you have a very huge divide between Palestinians and Jews. Okay, that's, you know, that's fascinating. I, I wanted to kind of just uh, uh, sort of circle back here for our audience. Um, you know, the term Zionism is an extremely loaded term today. It is either used as an insult uh, by you know people, or it's used in a as as in a kind of very positive way. But it certainly has a highly politicized meaning, and of course, the meaning of Zionism today, as you've sort of alluded to, is very different. Can you just talk? Uh, you know, we often see Zionism as being a product purely of European anti-Semitism and sort of uh, European uh, the European Jewish community. Uh, you know, giving up on integrationist approaches and sort of uh, moving towards the separatist nationalism posture. But what I'm struck by your work is, and you sort of alluded to this, is firstly how we look how we look at who is the agent behind uh, you know creating a modern Zionist movement, and you know how does that relate to the Jewish community of the Ottoman Empire, not just in Palestine. But you know there were Jewish communities across the Ottoman Empire. How does how does Zionism relate to the Ottoman Jewish community in a broader sense? And sort of a second and a third part to this is what are the different meanings of Zionism during this meeting beyond the political Zionism we all think about? Uh, and sort of finally, you reject the distinction between Zionist and anti-Zionist postures between uh, in the Jewish community, and you you sort of. You sort of say that often when we look at this period, we're looking at these two postures. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on, on, more on those points so we can kind of get a, our audience can get a better understanding about what we're talking about when we talk about Zionism during this period, and you know that it's not a unified movement, but is a sort of a, a, a rainbow of different political opinions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so first of all, it's quite fascinating to see. I mean, if we look at the beginning of Zionism, that it, it happened. You know, it. it it emerges in the 1880s. The great uh, Zionist uh, historian Anita Shapira, um, uh, from uh, an Israeli uh, scholar, um, gives the important words that Zionism was born out of a great disappointment. And that disappointment was that Jews in Russia and Eastern Europe were unable to integrate into the uh, national whole because they were basically weren't um, Russian and Russian Orthodox. So what we see is that Zionism is a reaction in a great extent to not being accepted into the local um, communities. And that's why for so many years, the French, German, Western European and American Jews stayed very far away from Zionism in a sense, because it, it sort of conflicted with their idea of, uh, you know, integrating into America. Now, of course, this changes greatly after uh, the Holocaust, when uh, I would say the majority of Jewish people uh, worldwide um, become sympathetic with the idea of a Jewish state, Jewish homeland uh, in Palestine, which would turn into support for Israel later on. Um, now, what is it in the in already in the in the early 20th century, by 1908, um, the Young Turk Revolution? The British, and it's at the British Embassy, is spreading the idea that the Zionists are behind the Young Turk Revolution. That's something that remains until today. A very, you know, in, in, you can go just write Zionism, Freemasons, and Ataturk, right? Um, and you're going to say that they're going. You're going to say that the first Jewish state was Turkey, and the second one was Israel, right? Um, and the anti-Zionism language. Surprisingly, in the Ottoman Empire, I show my book, um, was anti-Semitic. It was really anti-Semitic. It had nothing to do with Palestinians, by the way, also. The Palestinians, when they're fighting against Zionism in the parliament, they come out clear and say, we are not with this group, okay? Um, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, the Jews trying to get a hold of land in Palestine. So, so there was a real big confusion in the Ottoman lands of what Zionism was. At the same time, you had Jewish territorialists 
Um, you know, the, the, the famous phrase, a land for uh, a land for people, for people without a land, by Israel Zangville. Um, that was said once about Palestine, but Israel Zangville was never for mass migration of Jews to Palestine once he understood it wouldn't work. He was trying in 1909, I write about it, to create a, a Jewish homeland in Iraq. He was trying to buy land from the Ottomans. He says, Palestine's not going to work, let's buy a strip of land. So the debate on Palestine in the Ottoman parliament is also about Jews in Iraq. It has nothing to do really with Palestine. So um, the whole anti-Zionist language is really conspiracy, conspiracy theory based. That's one thing. Now what happens is in the Ottoman lands and the lands of uh, where uh, the majority of Jews are Arabic speakers or Ladino speakers, that there was a large group among them that started sympathizing with Zionism as a cultural re uh, uh, revival movement similar to Arabism and similar to uh, what, the, what they saw was happening with Turkism during this period, right? The, uh, Turkish nationalism during this period. So it was, it was a very, I wouldn't say a well thought out Zionism. You had Ottoman parliamentarians, Jewish parliamentarians, Nisim and Al uh, Nisim Mazliak. You have uh, two or three, four of them. But Nisim Mazliak was, he prided himself that he was voted in to the Ottoman parliament by a majority Muslim vote. This is in Izmir. He's from Salonika. And, you know, of course, the Jews of Salonika lose, the Ottomans lose this land in 1913. Um, and many of them were cut off from their homeland um, during this period. He was a Turkish nationalist also, you could argue. I mean, very pro-Turkey, pro-Ottoman by this time before, but in a very sense that Jews should be learning Turkish also. Turkish was the main language. But for him, Zionism was that Jews would learn Hebrew in the, in the, in the kindergarten classes. He said that would be very sufficient for us. And that's, so it's more of a Jewish pride that you're seeing. It's not separatist nationalism. And I think that's when we get confused because so much of the work, I would say over the last two decades, actually argued that local Jews were anti-Zionist and, they, and they, they, they were not at all influenced by this. What I'm seeing is, yes, they were very, very influenced by it, but it was just a very different type of uh, uh, Zionism during this time. Um, it was one very much reflecting the Ottoman uh, Ottomanism that we had talked about. So I could call it uh, uh, Ottoman Zionism. Um, and uh, among the Ashkenazi Jews, um, by 1913, 10, 11, you have Zionist, uh, forces fighting, a unit fighting in the 1911 uh, war with Italy. Um, there is a Ottoman Zionist unit. I've only read about them two or three times. I found very little um, information on this. Um, but there's also in 1913, one of the peoples, you know, we have, I write about Karmi Effendi, and Karmi uh, is someone that was born in Palestine. His father's from Russia. His father's a Zionist. He moved to, to Palestine. The son joins the Ottoman army and starts fighting um, in the wars and in, eventually dies in World War I as a POW uh, in uh, a Russian uh, POW camp um, after the war he dies. And he's memorialized in Ottomans as a shahid for the, for the, you know, a martyr for the Ottoman Empire, but he's also uh, memorialized in Zionist history and Israeli history also. So yeah, yeah, at this time you get, I would say, there's a lot of confusion what this is. Let me end by saying that, that a lot of the conspiracy theories put uh, them together with Freemasons. And lo and behold, the Palestinian parliamentarians themselves, means, you know, when they go to argue, you know, against the growing powers of the, the Jewish Yeshuv in Palestine, they're met with this very anti-Semitic group that's actually very anti-Freemason. And many of them were Freemasons also. So in a very weird way, the opposition to Zionism in the Ottoman lands um, really never met a very practical opposition to Jewish migration to Palestine by Palestinians. So I think that's something key to understand here also. Pascal, do you have any questions at the at this point? Yeah, I'd like to talk about how the uh, internal class divisions amongst the Palestinian people helped facilitate 
uh, extraction of land and turning it over to uh, particular Zionist Jews coming to Palestine. Mm -hmm. Yes, could I just roll that? There was someone that brought up a question on here. I saw Matt, uh, Matt Levine here wrote something. Um, and it's and his question was, yeah, so basically the Ottoman, and I'll come back to your, your point, uh, Pascal, maybe I can sum up about Zionism. So basically the Ottoman Zionists were not at all connected to political Zionists in Europe. Well, uh, Matthew, that's a, a great question. Actually, by 19, you know, uh, 1905, 1906, the Zionist office, had, the Zionist organization has a Palestine office. Um, and they are um, translating uh, Arabic newspapers by, a, you know, there's, there's a, a local Arabic speaking uh, Jew uh, that, that is uh, that's <coughs> translating. They are also helping to buy land. And that's where you get the colonial aspect of it, right? Where they are providing uh, financial resources. By 1910, and this is key, the Zionists, by the way, the Zionists were, uh, invested a lot of uh, uh, um, interest and in lobbying in the Ottoman Empire also, the, the, the European Zionists, um, by opening up a newspaper network in, in Istanbul. Um, they were very unsuccessful, I think, in the end, and they didn't, they didn't really make any gains. Um, and that's what we see is that the only thing that they made gains was their investing in the local Jewish community, immigrant or non-immigrant alike, and and taking uh, i would say a back seat to what was happening they certainly weren't the motivating factors there and certainly were were very un unable to 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 actually reach a deal with the ottoman empire to sell palestine right um and that doesn't come in my book there were moments where we hear that they once again offered money to buy palestine um remember that what abdul hamid said in it remains the official policy. Jews are not allowed to immigrate to Palestine. And by 19, uh, you know, they're allowed to visit only. We know that that wasn't successful because of corruption and because of other, um, because of the capitulations, the extra territorial rights of, of, of foreigners that they had. Um, so, so, but by the 19, by 1913, 1914, Palestinians are really pressuring them. And that really uh, pressuring the Ottomans to make changes. And that really connects with um, Pascal's question right here when we talk about the Palestinians. What was Palestinian resistance to Zionism? You know, if you look at the Palestinian newspapers around 1911, 1910, you're not going to get a, a, a very, you know, Palest the Zionism uh, occupies a very small part because, you know, what we see is that um, they had so many other interests and they had so many other problems to worry about that it didn't seem like the threat it would seem like two years later, 1913. By 1912, 1913, you see an uptick in uh, fears that they are actually losing the land. So Pascal asked about the, the divisions in the society. I think uh, what we have here is that the notables themselves, the, the, the families that, that mattered and that were connected to the um, First of all, Jews and Palestinians, urban people, seem much more connected to Istanbul than other cities like Damascus or Baghdad. And I think that, you know, I've started saying that Jerusalem was almost a suburb of Istanbul. And I have, I'm trying to develop this idea. So the notables were very connected to Istanbul. Some of them, you know, Ruhia Khaledi, the um, parliamentarian, was also served as an ambassador, other administrative positions. His uh, great uncle, Yusuf Diya al Khaladi, um, also served as the first parliamentarian, the first parliament, and then goes on to ambassadorship and later teaches in uh, Vienna um, languages. So we have a, a very high educated, uh, notable class in Palestine divided by two or three families. Um, yes, some of them are selling land to the Zionists. Um, but by 1910, 11, 12, we see all the different parts of society merging together. One of them are the peasants. Peasants are, for the first time in 1910, are going to be forced off their land by, it's not the first time maybe, but the, by in big numbers, by Jews buying land from um, absentee landlords. Okay. Um, and that's the first thing. 
And that creates, I think, fears among other peasants and fears among Mukhtar's village leaders. Village leaders are afraid because what we see is that Arabs and Palestinians were worried about two things. Every time, and this is something we completely overlooked, every time they talked about Zionism, they also talked about Palestinians leaving Palestine. They talked about immigration with the E. Jewish immigration and Palestinians Im leaving, immigrating, leaving Palestine. And that was a really great fear of theirs. So what we see is that we have, you know, Mukhtar saying, well, we're not going to be important anymore if we don't have peasants. And peasants, if we don't have land, we're not going to be important, right? And they start petitioning the Ottoman Empire. Why? Because they don't trust Pascal. They don't trust the notables. They don't trust the big yeah. family because of corruption often. So what we get is that when I go in the Ottoman archives, I started to find a lot of peasant petitions. And the peasants sometimes would um, write direct, directly to the, to the religious uh, affairs department in Turkey or the Sheikh al-Islam, right? The head of the Islamic affairs and say, we're being thrown off our land and your administrators aren't reporting this back. Okay, and it's also the notables. But by 1911, even 12, 13, you start seeing a new Palestinian press emerge that really makes us, this is, this is uh, I would say, I, remember, no one can foresee that the Ottoman Empire is going to fall. But this local patriotism is going to uh, turn into, uh, I would say, a Palestinian, uh, very clear Palestinian nationalism. Um, in retrospect, we can we can say that. So yes, it's um, it, it's fascinating to see that you have finally notables coming together with the press, which was greatly Christian, but not only Christian, together with peasants, and you have a united voice standing against Zionism and the strengthening of the Jewish Yeshuv in Palestine, and that makes it inherently Palestinian at this point. Well, I think we are running a little bit low on time now, so we're gonna. I guess we're gonna be heading off to the uh, the after hours very soon. Is the that correct, after Jason? After hours, the after hours segment. It's about that time, Professor Doctor Louis Fishman. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It, it's uh, I can't believe the hour went by so fast, um, and I I see so many questions that came up here, and I'm, I. You know, maybe we'll have, in the future we could have another meeting, or anyone can write me on my Louis Fishman at Gmail if you have a if you're not able to sleep at night because you're like, why didn't he answer my question? Uh, I have a question. <laughs> I'm, one, I'm one of these people, right? You know, like you go to bed, like did, did he not see my question? Was he ignoring my question? So it's Louis Fishman at Gmail. I will not answer you tonight, but I'll be very very happy to answer you later. That's for sure. It could take two weeks, but I'll answer you. Three weeks, but I'll answer you. Set yourself up for that one because you. <laughs> but, uh, but but we will be having more questions in the after hours so so there'll be an opportunity for people so people should sign up to be patrons to so they can come and ask their questions in the second half and if you we, didn't know we change our clothes in after hours or we stay in the same clothes uh we will send you a new link uh <laughs> so for the new link, if you want to see in the after hours, Professor Fishman says he's going to unbutton that uh, that button right there. Exactly. Yeah. That, 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 I'm going to do it right now. There we go. There we go. Oh! <laughs> you get the, oh. Taco meat. Taco meat. Give him the taco meat, Louie. <laughs> 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, for the super chats. Thank you, guys, for the engaging conversation. The one thing I love about this show is that when we bring uh, people on like Louis Fishman and, and blessed to have co-hosts like Pascal and Jean that help book the show and help get these questions together and help me put these uh, intro videos together. They're very informative, you know, just reading the chat, seeing, you know, people hit with the, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And then, you know, some people do know stuff about this because we actually have people that are, that are calling from uh, or, or writing in from from some of these places. So this it's I love it. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Jean and Pascal on air, so they know. Shout out, shout out to Janice Graham in the chat. We see you. Let's say that. 
No, it's all good. You always got to acknowledge the OGs. Shout always. out to LMA. Shout out to LMA. Oh, so also in the bonus patron after hours, we didn't tell this to Louis before we uh, suckered him into coming on. And now he's got his nut down. So he, it's a call in show as well. We, uh, we let people okay, call. Good. We're amongst friends. That's why I'm afraid to do it in this half because I don't. When people calling and yelling at me, I think we got yelled at yesterday. Somebody, not yesterday, was it Tuesday? What's today? Thursday? Somebody Thursday. yelled. At me. I couldn't hear them all the way, but I think they were yelling mostly at Pascal. I'm totally fine with that. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, are you ready for the bonus half, guys? Yep, I'm ready. We're ready. Patrons, ready are you ready? All right. Well, I'm about to end this stream. And thank you guys very much. And we are out. And I'm ending it with cartoons. So take that, Pascal.